Today on the Perception in Action podcast. What exactly are linear and nonlinear pedagogy? How does nonlinear pedagogy relate to ecological dynamics? So it's time for a call to action. Hi, this is Rob Gray from Arizona State University. I've been on a now over 25-year journey as a researcher, professor, and high-performance consultant to understand how we acquire and adapt our perceptual motor skills. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. Before we get to today's topic, I want to tell you about my new book. Yes, I've written a new book on skill acquisition called How We Learn to Move, A Revolution in the Way We Coach and Practice Sports Skills. It covers the ecological approach to skill from different angles, including practice design, the CLA, coaching, youth sports, designing technology, injury prevention, and using analytics. So I hope you will consider giving it a read. You can find the book on Amazon or by going to perceptionaction.com forward slash book. Now on to the show. In today's episode, I want to kind of continue what I started in my last episode when looking at how ecological psychology and dynamical systems theory fit together. Where does nonlinear pedagogy fit into the story? I realized that other than my interview with Jay Lee Chow back in episode 195, nonlinear pedagogy is a topic that I haven't really covered in any detail on the podcast. So in this episode, I want to dive into the concept in more detail. For this, I want to start by taking a little bit of a different tact. Instead of trying to define nonlinear pedagogy first, let's try to define what we mean by linear pedagogy. Let's travel back in time to your math class in elementary school. I know, I know, that's not a lot of fun for many people, but bear with me. Think of a simple linear equation like y equals mx plus b. For a system to be considered linear, there are some key properties. First, there is only one output, a single y in the equation. We don't have those curly bracket things where we mean that y could have multiple possible values at the same time. This, of course, maps onto the idea of the one correct technique in traditional theories of skill acquisition. In linear pedagogy, the coach shows up to practice knowing the one output they want their athlete to generate. The second key feature of a linear system is that it's deterministic. That is, we can predict exactly what the output will be just by knowing the inputs to the system. For example, if m equals 1 and b equals 2, we know that if we input x equals 3 into the system, the output will be 5. No matter how complicated the equation might be, the output is entirely predictable from the inputs. In coaching, this maps onto using a specific set of cues or drills, the inputs, likely the ones that you always use, and expecting a particular output, the ideal technique. That is, of course, what supports prescriptive instruction in coaching. The final feature of a linear system that I want to consider is superimposition. Simply put, this means that we don't expect there to be any significant interactions between the inputs to the system. To understand how this relates to coaching, imagine that I'm using a linear pedagogy approach as a baseball coach to try and get you to have the ideal swing. I know that getting you to hit a ball off a tee will result in you driving your hands through the ball. And I know that getting you to swing with a heavy bat results in you shifting your weight onto your back foot. In a linear system, the effect of combining these two coaching inputs, the T and the heavy bat, is just the sum of the effect of each input has individually, so driving hands through plus weight shift. This superimposition principle is what supports the commonly used practice of decomposing a skill into parts in traditional coaching. If the whole is just the sum of the parts, then there's no issue with isolating them, training them, and putting them all back together. So linear pedagogy has three key features. There's one system output, the correct technique, supporting the focus on repetition and reducing variability in movement. The output is completely predictable from the inputs to the system, supporting the notion that the coach knows the ideal movement solution and can prescribe it to the athlete. And finally, superimposition, where the whole is equal to the sum of the parts, supporting the use of decomposition, decoupled, and part training. Okay, now with all this in mind, let's look at the principles of nonlinear pedagogy. For this, we will bring in three key principles of nonlinear systems. First is the fundamental idea that there's more than one possible output, more than one Y in the system. We reject the idea of one ideal solution, instead propose that we can meet our goal with several different possible outputs. This, is, of course, aligns with the ideas of degeneracy and metastability. In coaching, our goal is not to produce one single desired output in the athlete, but rather support exploration for multiple Ys. 
Second, in nonlinear pedagogy, we recognize that human beings are complex non-deterministic systems in which the outputs, plural, are not predictable from the inputs. Fundamentally, this is the acceptance that there are interactions between the inputs to the system. So for example, I can't simply predict that giving you a weighted bat will make you shift your weight to your back foot because it depends on a host of input factors. Your physical characteristic, your intrinsic dynamics, the task constraints, is the goal to hit the ball hard or just make contact, is a pitcher throwing you the ball, and the environment. This is, of course, what Newell captures in his constraints triangle. The outputs, the behavior, emerges from the interaction between the constraints, the inputs. The presence of such interactions also shoots down the principle of superimposition. The whole is not equal to the sum of the parts. We can't decompose skills into parts and just put them back together because the parts interact with each other in meaningful ways. The output is not just a linear sum of the inputs. The final key principle is non-proportionality, which means that the change in the output is not proportional to the change in the input. This captures the fundamental idea in nonlinear pedagogy that learning, improvement in performance with practice, will not follow a straight line or even a simple relationship like a power law. There will be times where the same types of practice lead to no gains, small gains, a backwards decline in performance, or a huge improvement. This is consistent with Kelso's approach to modeling coordination as a dynamical system, where there are different routes to learning, from shifts in the attractor landscape to sudden bifurcations which completely restructure it. So the key ideas of nonlinear pedagogy are that practice is not designed to produce a single output in the form of an ideal technique, but rather encourage the athlete to develop multiple outputs. The outputs are not predictable from the inputs. We have to manipulate the constraints and see what emerges. We need representative whole coupled practice because the behavior that emerges depends on the interactions between the parts. And finally, we can't use simple metrics to evaluate learning gains because they will not follow a simple proportional path as we keep practicing. So how then does nonlinear pedagogy fit in with ecological dynamics? Some may argue with me that there's more to it than this, but for me, nonlinear pedagogy is really just the manifestation of the theory of ecological dynamics into an instructional method. It's just really ecological dynamics pedagogy. To quote the recent article by Chow and colleagues, nonlinear pedagogy captures key design principles underpinned by ecological dynamics to support practitioners in the design of practices with an emphasis on encouraging exploratory behaviors to develop individual movement behaviors. And the key design principles pertain to establishing representativeness in practice, a focus on task simplification, awareness on the impact of informational constraints, the functional role of practice variability, and constraints manipulation. End quote. So really, all the main ideas of nonlinear pedagogy, including the nonlinearity, are captured in ecological dynamics. I guess that is one reason why I haven't talked about it much specifically on the podcast. Whether it needs its own special name, especially one that seems to give a lot of confusion, is debatable. But I do think understanding how the principles of linear and nonlinear systems relate to coaching, which I hopefully help clarify a little bit here today, is important. Okay, that's it for today's episode. Remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or follow me on Twitter at ShakeyWaits. To find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including written transcripts, please head over to patreon.com forward slash perceptionaction. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled.